Hey, welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. I'm Colby, and I'm here with my friend Carter. And today we are sharing some summer updates. Yeah, so this episode, a little different than usual. Um, For both of us, I think, at least for me specifically, this summer is usually a kind of different season. I guess it's more pronounced since, you know, I get out of school and that sort of thing. Um, But it's usually a creative season. I think both of us um, enjoy summer a lot and the creative juices start really flowing and we're into new projects. And I know this summer I was reading some really interesting things and thinking through stuff. And, uh, we just decided that let's just do a brief little summer update. And this is just, it's a little more reflective on what we're working on and less about kind of exploring and specific creative idea. Does that seem Mm -hmm. fair? Yeah, definitely. And I think it, you know, hopefully we can share updates maybe every six months or year or something like that so that we have, you know, just kind of keep sharing some updates on the creative journey and what we're learning in real time and how we're applying what we're learning, I guess. Yeah. And so we may do like a New Year's episode. I know we've kicked that around like a creative year in review. Uh, Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, I guess, the midway, the biannual point. So, Kolb, do you want to start with what kind of projects were you working on this summer or were you working on any projects at all where were you with kind of your creative uh ambitions and um projects and all that sort of stuff yeah so i'll break it up into a few categories um the summer is not quite the same for me because i still you know i'm not in school so i still just kind of work 40 hours a week and do my own do my normal grind but uh i do I did get to do some fun things this summer and some fun projects. So I'll share a few updates. First of all, the first one I'm sitting in right now, (laughs) which is I made a little portable vocal booth for recording vocals at home, which is kind of just like a fun side project. But I was like, it would probably, it would be really nice to not have to make a fort with blankets in my house when I'm trying to record vocals. And so I literally just grabbed PVC pipe from Home Depot and um, some, um, moving blankets from Amazon and probably in total it was $150, but it's just like a little rectangular, um, vocal booth with some lights in it, um, for recording and having kind of a cleaner, quieter sound. So yeah, it's, that was a fun little, probably just a couple like made it in an afternoon, but took some time to plan it and figure out where I was going to buy the stuff and all that. So. Yeah, you got really handy with that, getting thrifty with your materials there. So you've already tried it, right? How did uh, I think you said that you had a recording session? How'd that go? Yeah, I've recorded in it one time, and the vocals turned out really good. Really, like I don't have it currently. Like in this recording, I have the the blankets not covering all the way around. If I was singing or recording vocals for you know like a song, I would probably have it fully wrapped in the blankets. Um, so it might not sound as dead right now as it would in a different context, but it's very quiet. There's not as that room reverb has gone and just like helps with background noise as well. Um, so yeah, it definitely sound like sounded really clean whenever we recorded. I was pleased. I was like, this was a good investment and, uh, it looks a little bit janky, but <laughs> it works. Yeah. I feel like those are the like small things that, I don't know. It's nice to have a change in materials and have a change in what you're doing. Like it's just a thrifty way to get a little more quality product. And so I think we're always kind of looking for a little bit more of an edge on that. And so, yeah, that was a uh, nice little summer project. Yeah. And it was, it was fun just cause it's, it was making something with my hands instead of working on a computer too. That was one of the big reasons I wanted to do it was just, it ended up not being this huge investment. I wasn't even, I didn't even have to really like cut anything. Like they cut the pipes for me at the Home Depot and I just literally like plug everything together. (laughs) It's really simple, but it was planning it and drawing out the schematics and, you know, figuring out what materials to use and getting help from, um, I reached out to an engineer I know to get some advice on what the best thing to do would be for the situation. So it was fun to just like turn it into a little project that wasn't what I normally do day to day. So it was fun. Yeah, and it's portable. That's nice too. You can break that thing down, take it on the road. Totally. And then also alongside that with music, I started working on 
a new EP with one of my friends. We're working on that and it should be coming out soon. It's been fun to work on already, but I'm, I'm really excited to see where it goes. And I got to, I don't want to give too much away, but definitely uh, got to be really creative on the sound design. And so, yeah, really excited about that project. It's been a lot of fun and worked on one uh, beat with my friend. That's a really fun song. And so I've kind of started to dabble in production again. I actually should back up one step and say, this year I decided to take a break on music for a while. And so that was kind of the big update is I didn't work on music for about six months, probably like most of the first half of the year. I completed one song during that time. And then I took a break and then he brought up the EP. And so we started working on that very recently. But really, I took most of the summer off. Yeah, it was it was a good summer for music because I slowly am coming out of that break and the creative ice is thawing a little bit. Along those lines, I would say that music has really been just something that I'm kind of getting back into as a hobby and trying to do for fun and from a place of rest and not trying to push myself super hard on it. So that's just been a change of pace as well after the break. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Just kind of where you feel like you are with music because I know you were taking some time off, kind of regathering, readjusting um, seeing what sort of, I don't know what you call it, like what sort of practices that you want to make into habits and what sort of goals you want to set with music and I guess your professional life and personal life. And yeah, where do you feel like you are compared to, let's say, January of this year? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that I'm at a place where music is still super important to me and I want to keep producing and keep getting better at that. That's a craft that I'm really passionate about. But I think that there was a time where I was really caught up in making money through that production avenue because that's what I was doing on the side. And so it was like, let's see how much I can make on the side. How can I monetize this skill? And I think that the the challenge is that it's hard to monetize that. And maybe I will, but I think that was just putting a lot of pressure on it and distracting me. And so I, there was just a lot of confusion about motivation and what are my motives. And I think I'm at a place now where I'm trying to really just look at it as something that gives me joy when I work on it. And I I don't know if that's the best advice to, per se, because sometimes the thing that you might love working on is just going to be hard and you have to push through it. But for me, it's like, it's not my day job. And so I don't know. It's it's just a it's a wrestling, you know? It's a wrestling of sometimes you have to do things you don't enjoy, but it's weird when something that you love gets hard because you're trying to work out your relationship with how to monetize it and how much can you take on. Um and really it's just it's a challenge to balance a full-time job where I'm learning a lot of new things with being creative on the side too. And so I think I'm definitely in a better place than I was before, but it's still a place where I'm just navigating my relationship with music and figuring that out, you know? Yeah. It's always something that you're working out. And I feel like you've got a lot of different areas though, even besides music where you're pursuing the craft too, with things at work and marketing and stepping into different roles. And yeah, I feel like you've learned a ton this summer, or at least you're kind of, uh, your focus on these non music crafts have been really pointed. Definitely. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but yeah, I would probably recap all this by saying I took a break on music this year, and so I didn't do much, but I worked on a couple songs that I'm really excited about and proud of, and working at that slower pace has been really good for me. And um, there's a couple other updates that I'm really excited about that I'll dive into now. So the big thing that I would look back on my summer and say I'm really proud of and grateful for is just being able to read a lot. I read a lot of books, um, kind of just kept exploring new ideas and um was exposed to a lot of new ideas and I think that made me better at work and also just expanded my mind creatively too. So I wanted to kind of share a couple of those. Um, yeah. So deep work, a world without email and digital minimalism were the three books I read from Cal Newport. I've already mentioned that on an episode. Um, and I also read effortless by Greg McEwen and, um, that was a really helpful book, especially as it relates to just um, managing different projects and what. how do you handle life when it gets a little overwhelming? You have too many pans in the fire or whatever the phrase is, too many irons in the fire. Um, that was a very helpful book. And 
additionally, this summer, I've kind of started pivoting at work from a marketing role to a product management role and product ownership. So really just uh, learning as much as I can about how to build digital products, the software development process, and um, business in general. And so I read quite a few books related to that, like um, Inspired by Marty Kagan, Build by Tony Fidel, who Build was the book I read almost most recently. And that was an incredibly interesting book. So Tony Fidel, there's an awesome podcast with him and Tim Ferriss. I recommend that episode. But he worked on like the first 13 generations of the iPod and the first iPhone. And he invented the Nest thermostat. That was his idea and his company. And um, super interesting um, entrepreneur, founder, you know, product uh, guy and just really interesting person in general. Um, Really enjoyed that book. And whenever you kind of think like product and transitioning into that role has been really interesting and um, made a lot of sense to me because it's such a creative role and it's such a, it's not quite as hands-on as actually making something with your own hands, but it's so uh, integrated between my interest in making new things and marketing and digital technology, all those kind of intersect. And it's like everything except music, you know what I mean? Like it's so connected to my passions and interests that it's made a lot of sense. And I think marketing makes a lot of sense for me too. So I'm not saying that I'm like done with marketing forever by making this pivot, but I definitely feel really excited to be learning this new role. And so that's, so I've really that's part of the drive of why I've been reading so much is I've just been trying to keep up and I feel like I'm over my head. So I'm just, just trying to get as much information as I can and, and learn. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you share that because you were taking kind of a, yeah, a sabbatical from music in a way, but you had all sorts of stuff going. Like, I feel like you had a really fruitful summer of mm-hmm. learning things that yeah. are totally pertinent to creative processes, uh, creative like occupations and vocations and um yeah i don't know i feel like you've learned a ton just through our conversations this uh, summer so definitely see i like that you emphasize the connections there like you've got all these kind of creative pursuits and uh all these issues that we talk about on the craft those totally transpose onto your stuff at work most of the time um so yeah, that's a, that's a big, big shift. It's been, I mean, even just kind of looking back over the last couple of years, a lot of knowledge you've, you've had to kind of adapt and, and soak in. Yeah. I'm, I'm super grateful for the place I'm in and, and just all the stuff I'm learning for sure. Um, do you want to popcorn back to you or do you, I've got pretty much one more thing I was going to share, but sure. Why don't you go ahead? Cool. Yeah, let's do it. Um, the last update was, uh, song maps, my kind of project where I break down songs for music producers and try to pull apart what makes them work and why they're in, why the songs are, you know, great in the first place. Been working on that very slowly this summer. I was, I had a lot of energy at at the beginning of the year for that project, but I've kind of been slowing down on it. Um, so there's a, a slow trickle, but I, a couple updates there. I've put out about four new songs this summer, breaking them down. And also, put up a feature where people can go on songmax songmaps.co and like request a new song if they're interested in it so that was a new improvement and um just just some small tweaks other than that but that's like a that's like one of those slow projects that i i really love working on or i love the concept of it but i can get you know it's it's one of those things where i'm just like taking my time with it and building it slowly over time and um so it's not grown a ton yet, but I really, I'm grateful that I started that project this year and kind of made, just made some small steps on it this summer. Yeah, you've made some, I mean, that's that's a modest way to say it though, too. I mean, you have made a lot of, I mean, you've got a great looking website. You've put out some really good content pretty consistently. Uh, so I definitely feel like there, that has yeah. grown pretty substantially from, let's say, yeah, the new year. Uh, what's, yeah, what's, sure. what's next on the horizon? I know it's a slow burn project, but what's next on the horizon for song maps? Man, I've got a lot of ideas. I'm just trying to figure out which ones to pursue. Um, 
I think it's easy to like get the shiny object syndrome for me on that project and be like, oh, I should try to start do this. I should start doing that. I should start writing this kind of content. Um, but I have a few ideas. And the I guess the first one is just keep putting out new songs. Um, and I'm kind of adapting the format. So beforehand, I kind of was just picking a song, throwing it up there and having the song name like be the title. And I kind of realized that that's that you land on the page and you just see a bunch of song names, but you don't necessarily know like what the post is going to talk about. And so if you go on there, I actually change the titles to have some more context about what you're going to learn. So like, for example, how to break four rules of pop music and still make a hit or chorus melody and simplicity, the recipe for a great song. So I, I'm trying to, really hone in the message on each song of like, this is the thing that makes this song great and actually pull out things that if I go back and read these will be really useful for me to remember. Uh, Cause I want it to be a resource where I'm like documenting what I know about production for myself and for other people too. So if I was, you know, five years ago starting to learn again, it's kind of the resource that I would want to have if that makes sense. Um, totally. And I, li- I like that piece that change to yep. give something that's, I don't know if we want to call it the takeaway, but there's something like didactic about it of like, yeah, here's something I learned. Like this is the essence or this is the kind of uh, digression from norm that seems to be really effective or just giving, giving the readers, especially like with your audience, what's that practical application. I think that just makes the song maps more than just a reference sheet, you know, Definitely. like it's more than just a, breakdown that you can kind of look at like you would a dictionary it actually has some like outward facing prerogatives and outward facing um messages yeah i I really like that Mm -hmm. yeah and i feel like there's a lot of ways that i want to take song maps i just don't know what i'm going to do like part of me wants to build out a library of like production techniques so more like a dictionary like you would you just said actually more of like like a place where you could peruse all these different types of techniques essentially um kind of like a recipe book if that makes sense for yeah. song for mixing and production where you could just f- see and filter maybe like you're working on drums and you could filter and see a bunch of different techniques for how to mix drums and how to produce drums um or how to that's produce like a vocals. handbook that's like totally. a handbook for production yeah. That could be um, totally useful. And that would be more like truly documenting, like trying to get on paper, like every technique, every idea I know, and like putting, kind of putting the secret sauce on online. Not that I have anything so secret that, you know, but really just like trying to document that. Because if I had something like that when I was getting started, it would have helped me to understand um, some of the different things, like have things in one place, if that makes sense. Um, so that's an idea. It's an undertaking that, We'll see if I have time to do and invest in, but that's definitely something that I keep. It's one of those ideas that I've had and then I let it go and then it kind of comes back and I get excited about it again and it's happened a few times. So it feels like there's something there and that it might happen. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ideas. We'll see what happens with it, but definitely check that out if you haven't yet. For sure. I mean, it's been a lot of growth, I feel like, in the last year for Song Maps. Yeah. And I just really like it. It's just great to have those slow burn projects. Yep. So let's get into it, man. It's been a good summer. What's been going on with you? Yeah. So for my summer here, don't have a ton to share. It was a, I would say an indulgent summer. I just kind of, uh, I read a bunch of stuff that I wanted to read. And uh, most of it was 20th century canon, mostly. Um I read a lot of novels, so the last semester was heavy in philosophy, heavy in theory, thinking about Adorno, Heidegger, aesthetics, very conceptual, the courses I was taking last semester. And so when summer came out, I was like, I got to read some fiction. I got to read some novels now. Uh, And so I read, here I've got a list of kind of a summer reading. I read Farewell to Arms and uh, Green Hills of Africa by Hemingway, read some E.E. Cummings poetry, read Martin Eden and Valley of the Moon by Jack London, The Road, Corp McCarthy, Absalon, Absalon, Faulkner, The Crying of Lot 49, Thomas Pynchon, A Movable Feast, Hemingway. I was on a big Hemingway kick this summer. 
uh, Angle of Repose, Wallace Stegner, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. So I read a lot of great 20th yeah. century fiction. And it was just really enjoyable summer because I started a job at the James E. Pepper Distillery, mm-hmm. which was really neat. And so getting into the craft of bourbon making, whiskey making as a tour guide. So I'm working as a tour guide there. And it was a really nice balance of working at the distillery, learning about this new craft. I actually got to go back and work on the production line some when we were shut down. It's a little uh, little That's assembly cool. line action, bottling, which was neat. But it's a whole c- different craft that I was able to just have fun exploring, learning the story. It's like a 200-year-old um, history at James E. Pepper, all the way back to 1780 with Elijah Pepper. So it's a great story. It was fun to meet new people. And that was balanced with a lot of reading. And it was just a really nice um, back and forth between working and learning and, and discovering new things. And then just going to what really draws me to literature, the experience of engaging another mind uh, through reading and, and all that does. So that was a, that was a big part of my summer, just kind of taking the foot off the gas and just working and reading which is a great i mean it's a great combination for me i feel like some people would look at that list of books and be like your foot was definitely not off the gas that is a lot of reading (laughs) but that's really cool man dude i had a colleague and they read like eight hours a day every day they're crushing it uh so i was i was not doing that uh but it was it was a great great summer we we got to take some trips, head out west, do some fly fishing. And so all those things that we've talked about, about getting in, getting into nature, going and doing things that aren't craft related, like it just fed into my creative work. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of worked on a creative nonfiction essay about time in Montana. And I'm still going to probably try to do something with that. I'm actually in a creative nonfiction workshop as one of my courses this semester with Eric Reese. Uh, Really great really great writer about Appalachia and religion and Southern culture and aesthetics and philosophy. Uh He's written on uh, mountaintop removal. He's got a really good collection of essays called Practice Resurrection. And so it's been really fun to be in his course. And hopefully I can work through some of this, but I've been thinking about that creative nonfiction essay as a genre and got into a little of that this summer. And so that was most of the creative work that I did. I didn't do a whole lot of writing. A lot of reading, not a whole lot of writing. There were things percolating, and uh, there's definitely stuff that I could have done. But I was trying to be mindful that the summer was transient and that I would be back, and sure enough, writing again here this semester. So that was those were the big kind of creative things for me some modest creative work, um, some modest reading, and just some beautiful, great novels, which was a blast. Did you have a favorite book that you read or what stood out? Good question. Uh, I So I'll just say two things. I've talked about Absalon, Absalon a lot, I feel like, on the last 10 podcasts. But when I read it, it just like totally blew my mind. It, it's probably my contender for the uh, the greatest American novel. Big, big words, but I'm throwing it out there. I also really enjoyed The Road by Court McCarthy. It was one that I had been meaning to get around to. And so I'm actually reading Sutri right now by McCarthy. I'm getting close to finishing it. He's just a master wordsmith. He also wrote No Country for Old Men, Blood Meridian, um, the Border Trilogy. So he's written some some heavyweights, and I'm really, really enjoying McCarthy. And hopefully will be doing a conference presentation in February um, on his use of language and um, and dream and linguistics and uh, and suchry. So That's we're awesome. looking forward to that. We'll we'll hear back me and a couple of uh, a couple of guys from UK about that conference. And so McCarthy w- is definitely on my mind and was very much yeah that that seed was kind of planted this summer that I've now picked up suchry and. Um, and really kind of dove in. I, I love Blood Meridian. I read last semester. And so I just kind of kept that strain going. So that was definitely one that went right through summer and I'm still working on right now. But that's what I'm up to. Back into classes now. 
as summer uh, closes down. Did it fly by? Yeah, man, it's gone. So yeah. it was great. We we did a lot of fun things and some some rich experiences together and with our family yeah. and just feel like we're settling into the new home and getting to know Lexington and uh, getting to know the community more. And I'm just looking forward to this fall, just pressing deeper into all that. It, it's been, I don't know if we've said it before, but we've just been looking forward to like dwelling somewhere. It's been mm-hmm. a lot of moving in the last four years for us bouncing around graduate programs. And so now hopefully we'll be here for a while. And um, yeah, just enjoying being in a place. Got the office set up, starting to send the uh, the roots into the ground, plant some uh, plant some flowers and bushes. We got a hydrangea out front now and some uh, little cypress. So slowly transforming the uh, the the landscape of our of our yard. So little modest things, man, this summer. Yeah. No, that's awesome. It's it's definitely an idea that's been more and more compelling to me of just how, um, I guess really just the idea in general that's been on my mind a lot recently is just compounding and how that the recipe for compounding is time and, and being rooted and being, you know, like even with art and with with life and with art, just being um, rooted and and staying in the game for the long term. Like, I don't know if this is too off topic to, to pull in, but I was reading this, this, uh, chapter from, um, the psychology of money, a book by, I think it's Morgan Housel. And, uh, he's got a chapter in there about compound interest, but I think it really applies to a lot more than just money. And he kind of talks about how everyone like has all these speculations about how Warren Buffett became so wealthy, but, they don't really, no one writes the book called he has been investing since he was a child. He's been investing longer than anyone else and he's still doing it. And so he just basically is like the, the book that people don't want to read is just invest for the longest time possible without making a huge major mistake. Like that's the game. (laughs) And it's like with art, with life, with these other things, it's like, it's almost like just be in it for the long term and be rooted and be be patient and, and live a slower kind of quieter life than maybe what the rest of culture is talking pressing us to do all the time you know yeah i feel like that's a common thing for us to talk about like it's there's just no there's very very few things that are like instant in the creative world yeah i mean it's definitely. just not i mean it's just there's an illusion i was talking to my undergraduates um my freshman comp students uh, just the other day of there's just a there's a cultural perspective about who writers are writers are people who can sit down and write well it's like no it's like writers are people who mm. take time to revise four times and do five drafts like those mm-hmm. are your good writers it's a, it's not as if it's some spontaneous good writers can write well and just sit down and write beautiful sentences it's like no <laughs> that's not how any of that works it is that thing that like has to compound over time yeah. and you know, I'm even actually, this is somewhat related. I started a list of books that I want to reread. And yeah. like right now, I'm, as a young scholar, I'm trying to read like breadth, like as much stuff that's canon and major, you know, um, Western, especially American works as I can, which is what I should be doing. But at the same time, I'm just inspired to go back and reread some of these novels because they totally deserve to be reread. And I know Harold Bloom, who is a hugely influential uh, literary scholar, he would read reread stuff all the time. And that was like one of his like primary metrics about whether a work was artistically robust. Can it withstand multiple readings and still be a rich experience. And so that's mm-hmm. kind of like, that's a long thing. It's like, what's my relationship going to be with, um, with a book when I've read it seven, 10 times. I mean, that's why I like yeah. reading uh, river runs through it, which is just a short novella, but by Norman McLean every spring. So I've been doing that for a couple of years. Mm. It's like every year, man, it's like, I'm in a different place in my life. The book just, is different because I'm reading it again and really great yeah. pieces of fiction do that for you. I love that ritual. That's really cool. Cause I just, that's really caught me that you're like each year you're going to be in a different place maybe or a different stage of life or whatever, but the book is the same book and you get a different perspective each time. 
Yeah, and it's about those permanent things, man. It's about the natural world. It's about family. It's about brothers. Um, like those are the permanent things. Robinson Jeffers talks about in in his poetry. He's like poetry ought to be about permanent things, things that mm-hmm. are ever recurring. The grass, the trees. I mean, he was definitely nature minded, but yeah, it's the same thing with fiction. Like really great fiction is about human things. Like Angle of Repose, which I just absolutely love. That recommend it for people to read by Wallace Stegner. I mean, it's a story of a marriage. It's a story mm-hmm. of like a deeply uh, human thing. Love, faithfulness, satisfaction, discontentment, ambition, these sort of things. And so you read that. It's like you can be 65. You can be 25. Uh, you could be, shall we say, even 85, right? And, and these things are going to resound because they're what can pose human life. Yeah, man. I love that. That's beautiful. You know, I guess we ha- we haven't really talked about this, but if we do another episode, let's say in six months or a year, do you have anything that you hope to accomplish or knock out by then? <laughs> Any creative endeavors? I hope to be getting ready for my exams or have taken my exams. That's that's kind of big, just kind of, I guess that's almost professional for me, but that's where I'd like to be in the program. Also, I would like to have read... Um, all of Cormac McCarthy's fiction too. So I've got, he's actually coming out with some stuff this fall, which is exciting, but I'd like to get through uh, the border trilogy and child of God and uh, the orchard keeper. So some of his work, I'd like to um, go ahead and get his, his collection knocked out. So those are a couple of things for me. Last thing, I got a motorcycle this summer. So that was been oh, a yeah. new, new form of transportation. Which I which was fun. It's this really hot morning, and I went out to try to take off the the back seat of the motorcycle, which is like the simplest thing. But I'm such a motorcycle newbie, you know. I've got my phone out watching YouTube, uh, <laughs> but I was going out there, and I was like, I got it off finally. And there was this like really f- strange sense of accomplishment of like, oh man, I'm working on a motorcycle in the morning and I'm sweating. And it was just, it was this really funny thing because it was so insignificant. Uh, but one of those kind of rich rewarding things. Uh, so yeah. that's been fun. It's just a different kind of hobby and trying to learn to ride it and all that sort of stuff. And and we got it. We got it mostly out of practicality. But so that's been fun. That was another kind of thing. We'll, we'll throw that in the record book here on the podcast. Yeah, that's really fun. That's really fun. I feel like there's some stories or inspiration that could be pulled from just owning a motorcycle and those experiences. Anything else we want to throw to this summer, especially to our future selves? You got anything to say to yourself? Yeah. I mean, I hope that I keep going on song maps. I hope I keep putting things <laughs> yes. out as I think it's okay. It's definitely, it's totally fine that it's a slow burn and that it's just a trickle of things. But I hope that I take my own advice on compounding and just, uh, stay in it for the long term on that project because I think that it's a it's a fun project I think it's meaningful I think it could be helpful for people that are learning production for the first time and even just I think it could be helpful even for me to go back and find inspiration again so it's building a library for myself trying to scratch my own itch and then share that with others so I just want to keep slowly chugging forward on that and I kind of feel like I'm in this dip where I'm not the most inspired by it but I know that I will be again. And so I just want to keep keep it moving forward. And um, also just excited to keep diving into product management. I hope to be further along in my journey of just reading as many books as I can there. And more than that, just practicing the skills and learning how to do it in real time. And um, I hope to have some new music out with a couple friends. So, yeah. That's great. We have, uh, there it is. There's the summer updates, 2022, moving into the uh, the fall quarter, if you will. I think so. I don't actually right. know when the quarters are, but I think I think Yeah, I think it's October through December, right? Q4. Well, if you have any uh, updates from your summer that are worth sharing that you want us to know about or uh, books, actually, how about this? Any book recommendations that you would like to share from your summer reading? or just any any yes. um, feedback on our stuff here, then please send us an email at heycraftpodcast at gmail.com. If you're listening to this right now and you're washing the dishes, just know that we hear that. We, we, we want to acknowledge you. You're doing a great job. And uh, just send us an email and just say, yeah, I was washing dishes. Let us know. I hope you have a great day. Talk to you next time. 
Hey, thanks for listening to The Craft with Carter and Colby, where we share what we're learning about the creative process. If you're a writer, music producer, marketer, filmmaker, photographer, or you just love creativity, then this show is for you. Our cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewelldesign.com. That's Elizabeth, N-E-W-E-L-L, design.com. And you can follow her on Instagram at Elizabeth is a designer. If you like the show, there's three things you can do to help us out. First, subscribe so you learn when we post new episodes. Second, send the link to one of your friends who you think would enjoy the show. Uh, Really, word of mouth is going to be the the number one way we grow the show in any way. And three, if you have a topic you want us to cover or feedback about how we can improve the show or comments on what we've said, you can respond to heycraftpodcast at gmail.com. H-E-Y-C-R-A-F-T podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.